Wednesday, Thursday, January 19th. It's kind of funny. We're live at Sketchfest. Okay, everyone, I am Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we are going to fill your heads with lasers. And mothy business. But first, Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Those that do not believe in science do not believe because they lack education on how it works. Those that do not believe in science often do believe that aliens visit the planet in flying saucers and frequently abduct people with tractor beams. Which is ironic because that would take a whole lot of science to pull that off. Those that do not believe in science sometimes prefer supernatural explanations for things. On the 700th thousandth day, the Flying Spaghetti Monster did create high-speed Wi-Fi, which is why we're broadcasting live right now. Hey, Periscope! Those that do not believe in science don't always replace it with something else that works. Because, as they might tell you, they aren't scientists. And while there are many who would like to repeal science when it does not suit their interests, there is no replacement for reality. The following hour programming is not intended to turn you into a scientist or even teach you science, but the stories we bring can keep you informed, and we do believe in that. Here on This Week in Science, coming up next. smaller crowd than I usually have in my house. <laughs> right, the bleachers at your house. more intimate. <laughs> a little more intimate. Good science, Justin Blair, everyone out there, especially our live audience here at California Academy of Science. He is amazing. Yeah, there's science in there. There's science there's in so much science in there. all over this yeah. building. Right? Yeah, Blair was telling me earlier that they just discovered a new species of bird that just happened to be hanging out in a drawer. Yeah, downstairs in the downstairs. freezers? In the freezers, yes. They're, they're there. mass hoarding dead animals it's in like, the basement. Seriously, for scientists, have a hoarding problem. They're like, let's go out and collect things and just put them in drawers. And this entire building is very eco-friendly. Uh, which is, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. The, is anybody, well, it's probably in every one of the restrooms. Everybody just gone, right? At least once. The dryer thing that you gotta put your hand in that's covered in pubic hairs, this thing is. <laughs> I've, been, I've been walking around like just drying my hands in my shirt rather than. I've been, I've been scrunching. <laughs> All right, tonight on the show we have a lot of science lined up for you. We're going to run through things as fast as we can, bombard you with science. Especially since we are coming to you live from the 16th annual SF Sketch Fest, it was presented by Audible. We want to thank Audible for that. And on this week's show, the science news I have are stories about sharks not having sex. Oh. And laser-controlled mice, because who doesn't love laser-controlling mice, right? Great. Justin, what do you have? I have two stories on climate, yeah. And Blair, the animal corner. Oh, I have a good work-life balance, maybe. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> uh, That's funny. I have a new moth. Oh, boy. I'll, I have a new moth, and I have how to schedule your fun. Thanks, I think. We're gonna have to listen to that one. All right, everyone, let's dive in right now. I have first story right off the top. I wish I had the videos to show you what happened, what researchers did to mice in this study, because it's kind of ridiculous. They took lasers and stuck them in the heads of mice to figure out what causes the predatory instinct. So basically, they used lasers to turn little cute little mice into killing machines. Right? Yale University scientists, lead investigator, investigator named Ivan de Arajo, 
Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the Yale University School of Medicine and Associate Fellow at the John B. Pierce Laboratory. He basically, you know, wanted to find out. He said, it's a major evolutionary player in shaping the brain. Predatory hunting, right? There must be some primordial subcortical pathway that connects sensory input to the movement of the jaw and biting. And so basically, they started looking. They found, he found, had found a paper that identified the amygdala as having these connections to neural pathways, motor pathways that might actually control this behavior. So what did they do? They genetically modified mice so that they could control the neurons in their amygdala with laser light. And then they seriously shoved lasers in the mouse brains, and at the flick of a switch, turning on the laser, it changed the activity of the neurons in the amygdala and would make a mouse that was completely ignoring objects in its cage go from this nice, mild-mannered mouse to attack mouse. It changed the entire musculature and how it was used and the biting force. They discovered there were two neural pathways out from the amygdala. One that controls the predatory movement. So when you watch your cat stalking an animal, that is one part of the pathway. This is one part of the pathway out of the amygdala. And they can turn that on. And they found that separately, by turning neurons and genes on and off, they found that there's this second pathway that controls the killing bite. And so when they turned that off, the mice would become these predators and attack things, but they couldn't deliver the killing bite. It reduced the strength to the muscles of the jaw by about 50%. So they'd try, and they'd be like, Arr. <laughs> I'm going to get Arr. <laughs> Sort of like a wasted bar fight, where people are really intending on doing some damage, but can't quite connect. Yeah, so the, the take home from this is they're going to still keep doing more research into the functioning of the amygdala, but as you might have heard, the amygdala is responsible for our fear response, our anger issues, um, and additionally, there are other sensory inputs, and there's a hypothesis that the amygdala might be a gate that opens to allow behaviors that are maybe being controlled by subroutines that are running in the back, back, background to actually occur. So maybe mice that are not predatory can become predatory in certain situations. Maybe humans could become predatory in certain yeah, situations. Yeah, how could this go wrong? <laughs> dun, dun, dun! Million dollar question. Turning peaceful animals yep. into predators. Yep. Hmm, that's, that's a good thing we found out, right? Yeah. So it, something that's also interesting is I think that the development of the amygdala actually corresponded with the development of the jaw itself. So when animals actually structurally got a jaw and the muscles that the jaw is controlled by, that that's when the amygdala sort of started becoming more complex and responding to stimulation of, of different kinds. And so if you look at lampreys, which are jawless fish, their amygdala is not as complex as other jawed fishes. And so this is kind of where this hypothesis is coming from. Hey, the amygdala, the center of our predatory instinct. Predatory mice in theaters this fall? That's right, yeah. yeah. I think men have bigger amygdalas than women. I mean, not just Maybe because, yours. Just I don't know. I don't know. Not, not, just, not just like because of like, uh, you know, size of the brain, but like percentage of the brain taken up by it is slightly bigger. I, I can't comment on this right now. Do you have a story for me? <laughs> yeah, okay. So this is uh, according to a report released by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. There's a flood coming. And, and while an organization called NOAA uh, predicting a flood may seem like biblical mythology. The science behind this prediction is anything but. So worst case scenario, they took a bunch of different case scenarios like the, eh, maybe not so bad, kind of intermediate, in the middle of the road, high middle of the road, and worst case. Worst case was we could be seeing about eight feet higher sea levels by the year 2100. This is Robert Kopp, uh, Associate Professor of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Rutgers University which lays out all these scenarios. Currently, he says about six million Americans live within six feet of sea level, and they are potentially vulnerable to permanent flooding in this coming century. 
Well, before this happens, though, there are many areas that are going to already start seeing flooding. So there's there's a 20% chance uh, for a lot of uh, the Northeast of getting a a flood wave, uh, a sea crest, the sea uh, what is it called? This the increased uh, sea sea rise during a storm that could flood in. And that's 20%, so have one of these storms once every five years or so. Bye-bye, Ocean Beach. Worst so case to, to explain to you what sea level rise means, when we say six feet, it's, it's not six feet that way. It's six feet up. So that means if you think six feet up, that goes pretty far out past that tsunami warning area in San Francisco. Yeah. All kind of gone up to sunset. So oh, sunset. Yeah. What they're saying is it could, it's going to be a 25, uh, in the worst case scenario, 25 time increase in these surging waves. So that's that once every five year storm, five times a year. So then so then you're talking, okay, so even if the sea level rise hasn't gone up to where that's underwater in that neighborhood, uh, it will be. Uh, we're also looking at, we're actually gonna get kind of a break here on the west coast, the Pacific Northwest is not expected to see uh, too much increase. We're gonna be lower than the global increase. This is sort of an interesting thing. We think about these increases globally, like the top of the end, sort of worst case global average sea rise, 8.2 feet. That's global. But actually, out here on the West Coast, Pacific Northwest, we're going to be one to three feet less than that. But that's still if you're five in, to seven which feet. I don't understand, it's all the same ocean. <laughs> but if you're on the Northeast, you can be one to three feet above that. That's pretty significant. Then you're talking about a lot of areas underwater. But already, we, we could stop talking about the San Francisco Peninsula and start talking the San Francisco Island like pretty quickly, right? And and what's sort of also interesting in this is it's this is not, real estate advice, everyone. <laughs> it is no, they actually are. They're going. They're doing regional pro, uh, projections, right? Uh, so one of the also interesting things is in the in the depending on the case scenario, they've broken it down to when we're going to see that five uh, five time a year storm. If, if it's the worst case predictions come true, we'll be seeing that by 2030. And then you go to the intermediate, it's 2040, 2060, the lowest, the low one, like this is probably, the, this is gonna take longer than anybody's expecting, 2080. So what that means is, it's not if this is going to happen, it's now we're predicting when we're going to be seeing these catastrophic effects. And this is where we're laughing at the funniness. <laughs> <laughs> Comedy? Oh, the comedy part. So no, but this is true. This is true. Like, this is what we need to do. Because um, there's still too much of the public who's not getting the message on this. So we need to rebrand. We can't call it global warming anymore. This sounds like a setting on a thermostat. Ah, it's just going to be a little warmer, a little shorter winter, a little hotter in the summer. Some people in this country may be rooting for that, right? If you live in the, if you live in the north. Climate change, again, that's a thermostat control. That's no big deal. That's just a change. We need to call it what it really is. We need to call it a disease. We need to call it climate ia. If everybody starts referring to global warming as climate ia, I don't want my planet to have climate ia. This is not, we have to do something about this. We gotta start wearing that carbon cap. You know, there's prevention methods then. It becomes a health issue. If you just tuned in, you're listening to This Week in Science. You know what time it is right now? It's time for Blair's Animal Quarter. to work on myself. What? So, you know, I thought it would be best for everyone if I just what? kicked back. <laughs> so, I actually, I brought a story today about the work-life balance and when it's appropriate to be lazy. Pay attention. So, 
A uh, study uh, from Missouri University of Science and Technology looked at a work-life balance in ants. Ants and us were not that dissimilar. The researchers like to say that humans are like ants in a way that we all live together in groups, we collaborate towards our own betterment, and both humans and ants face similar problems of allocating resources based on tasks and energy. So looking at that, they want to look at how much time ants spend working and being lazy, sleeping. And they found that large colonies of ants use less per capita energy than smaller con colonies. That means that they are just lazing about a lot more. So in bigger groups, ants did not work as much. 60% of workers were not moving in 30 ant colonies, but 80% were not working in 300 ant colonies. It's a lot of ants not working. The per capita energy consumption was about, in, in the 300 ant group, was only about 50% of that in the 30 ant group. So by being lazy, they were actually helping everybody. So you need to remember that next time your boss comes up to you and asks, why are you on Facebook right now? Why are you not working right now? Oh, it's for the betterment of the company. It's Twist told me so, right? <laughs> So, I, I think that's I think that's a uh, form of ant propaganda that you got there. Yeah. Trying to encourage people to go on more picnics. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. What what it actually came down to was maximizing resource acquisition. What that means is that their foraging time actually was more expensive than not working. The, the positive, the net positive there was to not work, even though foraging, you would think, would be better for the, for the group. Balancing the two costs and benefits of foraging and lazing about found that by tracking ants' behaviors, they, they found that actually if a group is 20% active, the groups would consume 180% more, more energy than a similar sized group with inactive members if they did nothing all of the time. So you would think that would be the perfect excuse to just never go to work, but it turns out that there's an exact <laughs> middle amount that is perfect. So if you guys can figure out exactly how much to work to keep yourself and your community going while not doing any extra, you're actually doing everybody a favor. But this is not done by committee. Like, like <laughs> we could like just sit there, okay, who's not gonna work? We're show of hands. Like, oh, I, I, yeah. I already have my nuts. So I, I can't. <laughs> right. You gotta be careful because this sounds a lot like communism. To be it sounds like they just don't have that middle management in the ant world. Like, so there's says, nobody telling people to clock in. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, today is January 19th. Tomorrow will be an <laughs> interesting day. Mm -hmm. A new what? species of moth was found and was named in honor of Donald Trump. Woo! There are a couple things about this moth that make him particularly Donald Trump-like. The main one being that about, he wait, has... Wait, we're talking about the reality TV guy? Yeah, yeah, America, the reality TV I show. That, like, no, I thought it was like something about, uh, I don't remember the show. I did, uh, freaked by it. Is that small hands? He's <laughs> real small hands, yeah. <laughs> so it's not the small hands on the wall. It's actually, they have a it's something else. Of scale. Oh, 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 oh. I'm getting there. I'm getting there, There's a cluster of scales right under their heads. I'm telling them. Uh, it's nice and a uh, blonde, golden color. And it has some particular down there. So, and as you know, Blair likes invertebrate sex. So this falls right into the animal corner. It's fascinating. It's fascinating, really. Uh, so these moths, they were actually found in Southern California by a U University of California Davis entomologist, Dr. Vazric Nazari. Davis. Ooh, Davis! And what? We're in San Francisco. I'm trying to represent. This is a type of twirler moth. That's right. He's a twirler moth. And it's in the genus Neopalpa. And this is now Neopalpa Donald Trumpi. And they found that it was closely related to Neopalpa neonata. But what makes it really different? Not just the hair makes it it's different. It's not just the hair. It's the, it's, 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 the, it's the genitalia. Yeah, it's particularly different. Uh, it's actually smaller. It's narrower. 
And it's laterally notched, whatever that is. <laughs> the, the researcher who decided to name this moth Donald Trumbi says that, quote, the importance of conservation of the fragile habitats that still contain undescribed and threatened species was the motivation for this naming. I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like it I'm, might have had something to do with these smaller, smaller that's the No, that's a, that's a very diplomatic man. He's like, I'm gonna get this through. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna follow the script. Like, I, yeah. I'm gonna make it sound like, perfect. It's important to remember, you know, that in, in the developed areas like Southern California, there are still <laughs> new species to find and conserve. So, absolutely. What better way to bring it What down. better way? And I do want to mention the way that this was reported. Most, most outlets that did press releases on this said simply, new species of not moth named after Donald Trump ahead of his swearing in as president. One particular news outlet said, moth with scaly head and weird phallus named in honor of Donald Trump. <laughs> to be an moto don't care. <laughs> All right, moving on to more science, Justin. You're going to make it worse, aren't oh, you? Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's good news, Justin. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's like, I'm hey, we're going to a comedy advance. festival. I'm going to bring really serious stuff. Well, this is, because this is really important, though. This is another story that came out at the same time, this other one, the first one I did. This is uh, looking at sea surface temperature during the last interglaciation period. This is when we didn't have glaciers, uh, when it was really warm. Uh, this is the American Association of Advancement of Science reporting. They find that sea levels during the last interglacial period were between six and nine meters above their present height. Which, for those not familiar with meters, uh, nine meters is roughly equal to 0 .009 kilometers. So it's actually it sounds at first. The, uh, the Glasner Glacial Period uh, was 129,000 to 116,000 years ago, and it was thought to have been a bit warmer today than it is today, which is actually, in USA Today, that's how they reported it. It was a little bit warmer than it is now. Um, but this is the they just they didn't read the study. It's actually saying, oh, it's pretty much exactly what it is right now, not including the two last years we have on record, which are the hottest two that we have on record. The analysis reveals that the onset of the glass glaciation 129,000 years ago was roughly similar to the temperatures we had in the late 1800s. What's interesting is we're going to hear, and you're going, if you haven't yet, you will be hearing that, oh, see, there was the temperatures were like this before. Global warming is natural. It's a normal event. This is just the fluctuation of the planet. And they're right. That's true. What's different is, we went from these couple of degrees of change in 100 years, whereas they looked at 129,000 years ago, which was our 1800s, late 1800s, and 125,000 years ago, which is our now. So what took the planet 4,000 years of change, we just done in the last 100. Most of it in the last 20, 30 years. But it's just people! It's not humans, though, Justin. I mean, it, it can't be us. There's no way. No, no, it's, it's not us. It's the aliens and all their <laughs> boarding about and flying saucers and yeah, these light operated. Because aliens totally cavort. Yeah. You know they would. You know who doesn't cavort? Zebra sharks. <laughs> There's a new study that came out looking at, uh, it's, it's a pretty in interesting thing, you know, like Jesus was born to the Immaculate Conception through Mary, who, where that, how, how, I, I don't know, she didn't know either. He was just a good, he was just a good Jewish boy, his mother said he was a virgin, so he's like, okay, I'm going to perform some miracles, mom's going to be in right, science, I'm going to pack her up. In science, oh, no. in biology, we have a process describe when a female is able to have offspring without having sex. It's called parthenogenesis. 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 Zebra <laughs> sharks. And so, it's really interesting when we find 
cryptogenesis in vertebrates. It happens a lot in invertebrates, but not so often in vertebrates. However, recently at this aquarium, there's a couple of sharks. One was a mama shark who had previously been housed with a male, and she had had sexual relations with a male, and she had offspring from those sexual relations. But then, later, they were like, oh, we're gonna take these ladies, and we're going to put them into tanks by themselves. And so the daughter shark, the offspring of this mother, had never had sexual relations with a male. The mother, who had, she was there too, right? So we have these two related females, but they're held by themselves, away from males. Their environment changed. And all of a sudden, they're like, eh, I think I can do this by myself. <laughs> And so there is this process that Blair has talked about a lot in the animal corner, which is sperm storage, which is so the biologists are like, well, maybe the female, the, the mother especially, and I mean, maybe it was a sneaky little daughter jumped out of her tank yeah. and like, you know, the middle of the night ran away. We don't know, but maybe there no, was no, some sperm stored somewhere for the last three years. Certainly, <laughs> like getting a call from your high school sweetheart. <laughs> Guess what? I'm pregnant. I, I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. It would be like 20 years old now. No, no, it just, it just happened. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Yeah, so they, of course, had to do DNA genotyping to be sure. Was there a male involved? No, there wasn't. The offspring of both females was similar, genetically, basically genetically identical to the mother's. So, Nature so this was a baby that was a product of parthenogenesis, then did parthenogenesis. No, no, so the original product of sexual oh, relations, okay. right. and then did parthenogenesis. Right. The interesting thing is that the two females are related, so maybe that has something to do with it, we don't know. But there's something interesting here, and there's this, this old idea in, um, in reproductive science that maybe parthenogenesis is like accidental reproduction. That it's not an actual strategy that organisms use to reproduce and perpetuate their lineages. And so this is, we don't see it enough, so it's probably just, ha ha, happy accident, you know? Maybe that's what it is. But this study suggests that we're seeing, because they saw it in these two females, separately, but you know, in different situations, one had had sex before, one had not, but they both came to this solution independently that maybe this is actually a more standard response to changes in environment and a lack of sexual opportunity. I would be interested to see oh. if this is something that happens in the wild too, yeah. or if this is something that they figured out in just a couple generations living in aquariums, saying if you're gonna try to isolate right. us and keep us from doing this, you'll never now. keep us down! <laughs> Screw the aquarium patriarchy? Is that it? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, the aquarium patriarchy. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Cal Academy. <laughs> we really like this kind of aquarium, it's awesome. <laughs> They haven't validated my part yet. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Blair, tell me another story. Oh, so uh, I want to talk about how best to schedule your fun. Did everyone schedule their fun? Did you guys all schedule in your time at the Cal Academy tonight? Put on your calendar. Your calendar. I think it's two or three weeks ago. Yeah, I don't know. So, a new study from Ohio State University's Fisher College of Business and Washington University in St. Louis have looked at how best to enjoy your leisure time. So this is a good thing science is working on telling us how to have fun. Thank you, science. And they found that planning events leads to reduced enjoyment of those events. Yeah. So I would love to hang out with you later, but I can't say that I will because then I won't have fun, so maybe we'll find each other, but if we don't, that's okay, because if we did, I wouldn't have fun anyway. Wait, 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 Is this wait, wait, giving wait, wait, wait. people who oh, never yeah. respond to Facebook invites <laughs> that kind of easy out? You know, I think it simultaneously gives them an easy out and anyone who ever flakes on you an easy out. But because I need to be spontaneous. No, okay, yes. what are they comparing it to? So this is how they did the study. They took college students and they were given a calendar filled with classes and extracurricular activities and they were asked to imagine that this was their actual schedule for a whole week. So that, first of all, they got to imagine. Huh. 
<laughs> then half of the participants were asked to make plans to get frozen yogurt mm, with friends. <laughs> yeah, that's what we all do in our leisure time in college, right? Is get frozen yogurt. I think so, I did. So they made plans to get frozen yogurt with a friend or two, um, two days in advance, and they added it to their calendar. The other half imagined running into a friend and then just randomly deciding to get some frozen yogurt. <laughs> Scheduling getting frozen yogurt with their friend graded the activity as feeling more like a commitment and a chore than those who imagined to get impromptu frozen yogurt. So they found that scheduling fun activities takes them to a place of work in your brain. So, so sorry. We, we, next time we're just gonna we're just gonna try to run into all of you individually. Yeah. Yeah. Just do a quick show for you. If, if we just the three of us find each other, I know we live in different cities, but maybe we'll just come across each, and then we'll find all of you guys, and there'll be some mics there randomly, and then we'll have a grand old time. Oh yeah, sure. random podcast. Impromptu. Yeah. <laughs> then on an, in an online study, researchers had people select an entertaining YouTube video, and some of them got to watch it immediately, while others had to pick a specific date and time to watch the YouTube video. You guys do that, right? You put the YouTube video in your planner before you watch the video. Results show that those who watched the scheduled video enjoyed it less, and that those who watched it immediately enjoyed it more. So the suggestion from the study is to roughly schedule your leisure activities. Decide that you'll meet in the afternoon, don't say one o'clock. Cat uh, videos, Thursday, also, 2 p.m. Also, the people who they're, who they're uh, you know, the subject here, don't have children. Yes, call it. And, and there's, there's a point where scheduling sex is the only sex you're going to have. That's fair. That's fair. The thing that I, think about, uh, I thought about a lot when I was reading this was that if you make a, a commitment several days in advance, and then maybe you have a day at work, you kind of just want to get in and drink wine, and then you're supposed to go meet your friend for some frozen yogurt, uh, it might not sound as fun as if somebody called you up that day. It's something that, I don't know if it has to do with your variable state of mind from day to day, and that if they picked people who were 100% College students don't like to commit. That's what the that study is true. told me. That is true. <laughs> but I was thinking more about extroverts versus introverts. Well, there's that too. And I, I think that it's probably has a lot to do with it. But it turns out, guys, just don't schedule your fun. It'll happen upon itself, I suppose. <laughs> Let your fun be fun. Yeah. 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 How about your coffee? We all drink a lot of coffee before coming here. Can't notice. We had a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so there's a study at Stanford University School of Medicine published in Nature Medicine this week in which, not causation, once again, but correlation. We love correlation. There's a link between coffee and healthy aging. Longevity. If you want to live a long life, potentially coffee might help you out. They looked at a bunch of, uh, of people who were living long lives one hundred, more than 100 human participants over a multi-year study, and they looked at um, interleukin-1 beta, which is an infl inflammation molecule, and also their breakdown products, the metabolites, and they found that if they incubated, they, found, they had like a couple of different groups of people, and some of them were really high in the stuff, these clusters of genes that produce the interleukin beta, and others were very low in this stuff. And so the low group, were eight times as likely as those with the, than the high group to report having at least one really close family member who would live to age 90 or older. So the people with the low inflammatory marker, they're genetically in a lineage for longer lives. So we're already getting there, right? Anyway, they discovered if they put these interleukin beta products and their metabolites in with immune cells, that the immune cells ended up increasing production of inflammatory stuff. And basically they took the, um, the metabolites of the interleukin-1 beta, stuck it into mice, and the mice got massive inflammation and cardio, cardiac problems, and it was really bad for them. Terrible for the mice, right? And so uh, then they incubated immune cells with the breakdown products of, um, of these inflammation metabolites, and caffeine, no inflammation. The immune cells were just fine. 
And so uh, they ended up giving the mice caffeine. Mice were just fine. They didn't have any inflammation. And so they basically put together this pathway by which um, caffeine, if you drink it a little bit, it might be involved in reducing your inflammation as you age and keeping you healthier, which can lead to longevity. So coffee before you do a podcast. Ha! I love that. Although I'm very frustrated because my predictions for 2016 said we'd find that coffee was good for you, and I did not make that prediction for 2017. I'm still frustrated by that that much. All right. Uh, Since we're also in a place with an aquarium, I thought we should have another fish story. So uh, a story out of Los Angeles. This was uh, this group used DNA barcoding to track seafood mislabeling. Oh, in restaurants, right? So a four-year study, they analyzed sushi restaurants and high-end grocery stores to basically see, is the fish that these places are serving really the fish that they say they're serving? Oh, I'm sure they are. They're, they're, they're being really trustworthy about their sushi, right? Uh, yeah. No. It was a high percentage of mislabeling from 2012 to 2015. 40%, 47% of the fish was mislabeled. But it's not evenly spread across species. So, halibut, red snapper, yellowfin tuna, and yellowtail have consistently high occurrences of mislabeling. Salmon and mackerel were pretty low, like one in 10 was mislabeled for salmon or mackerel, whereas it was much, much higher for these other fish. So if you're going to a sushi restaurant and you want to know that the fish you're ordering is really the fish that you're ordering, order salmon. That's the, that's but, the but only sustainable salmon. So use your seafood watch out, guys. <laughs> Be yeah. that front. Yeah, so the question is, you know, they don't know at what point the mislabeling is taking place, whether it's people who are doing the fishing telling the people who are buying the fish that it's certain fish when it's not, or if it's the restaurants actually doing this mislabeling. We don't know at which point in the chain the mislabeling is occurring. But, we, we but the big problem is a lot of the fish that are swapped in are actually fish that are being overfished. And it's not good to be using those fish within our uh, restaurant system and our that makes pizza system. But yeah. obviously, we can't tell, right? <laughs> I mean, this is happening half the time you order something. How many people have been like, oh, that's the wrong kind of fish in this <laughs> Like, no, it, like, it's obviously, we can't tell the difference. Yeah. But you know what you can tell the difference between? Tequila that's good for bats and tequila that's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they put it on the label. <laughs> yeah, but there's a bat in there. my tequila watch app. Um, yep, the nectar feeding lesser long nosed bat has been struggling for survival. It's uh, where it lives is southern Mexico to southern Arizona and New Mexico, and there have been there's been work in place to try and increase their populations. And ta da, nectar feeding, you know what they like to eat? Agave, cigar, and organ pipe cacti. So Agave producers who are producing agave in Mexico for tequila are finding it very beneficial for their sales to say that they are bat-friendly tequila. They're helping to save bats while at the same time increasing their revenue. There, there you go. So, so you want to help wildlife drink to drink bat-friendly tequila. That's your advice for the rest of the night. There we go. Oh my goodness, we made it to the end of the show. This is incredible. Thank you, everyone, all of our friends. Awareness Day and Saturday right is now. Squirrel Appreciation Day. Uh, Squirrel Appreciation Day! Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, thanks also to SS Sketchfest for inviting us to perform, and also to the California Academy of Sciences for continuing to produce awesome nightlife events just like this, and for fighting a good fight for climate science awareness. It's pretty awesome. Big shout outs to that. Shout outs to our Patreon sponsors also. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. If any of you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. And also remember that you can help us out just by telling your friends about Twist. That's it, just tell a friend, each one of you. And next week's show, we're gonna be talking about nothing. We are, really. We're interviewing a guy, James Weatherall, or James O'Connor, that's his name, James Weatherall O'Connor. <laughs> But we're talking about nothing, really, the void, nothing. It's going to be pretty fun. 
And we broadcast live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live. And you can watch and join our chat room because we do have one of those. But don't worry if you can't make it live because we are a podcast and we also are on YouTube. So you can watch us at twist.org slash YouTube or just find our podcast at twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. We are, wait, you already said podcasting. Uh, we're also, you can find us on your phone if you have one of those mobile type devices now. Uh, there's, if you go into the, what is it, the Apple marketplace where this week in science. And, I and then uh, Android is the other kind of phone. And that one is Twist the number four droid. <laughs> Are, I don't know what that is. are you going off the cuff right now? <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, I'll ask my place. <laughs> that is fantastic. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes are available on our website. Do you know what our web- website is, Justin? It's www.twist.org. That's right, it's www.twist.org. And you can also make comments and start conversations with the host, that's us, and other listeners. They're or, on the website. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kristen at Kristen at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair, Blair Bass at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at TwistScience, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Klein, at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week. Well, not here. But we'll be on the internet next week on Wednesday at 8 p.m. And we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from this show, remember... It's all in your head. Yeah. 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 Yeah.